So in vitro diagnostics, so there's a, a definition. So the, uh, the, the, big, the, risk, uh, the risk in in vitro diagnostics is what are, what are the effects or what are, what are the, uh, the ramifications or, or consequences of a, a false positive or a false negative. So they are subject to pre-market and post-market controls. So adulteration, so these are some of the general controls for uh, in vitro diagnostics, but very similar to what you would expect with, any, with another uh, medical device. Uh, a big thing being uh, good manufacturing practices. Um, if you do have something really new and you need to uh, talk to the FDA, there is a mechanism where you, could, you, can, you can talk to the FDA, let them know about your technology so that when you do make your application, you're submitting uh, uh, the, the, the best possible application so it goes through the, the quickest. Uh, it seems to be in the industry right now, there's a lot of, uh, if you go to a regulatory consulting company, they'll, they'll give you a really good price on that, that application. It's almost unbelievable. Uh, so like $2,000, $5,000. But then, uh, but then when, after the application goes in, there's a lot of questions back and forth with the FDA. And that's when they, they get you with the $225 an hour fee and uh, the uh, bills that start coming in at $15,000 a month. So just be careful when you, are, when you are submitting your application, make sure that you've got as much that, you, that, uh, that they're going to have uh, so they, they can make a decision. It might involve taking a trip to, to Washington or having some conversation about uh, your technology. Um, so for a substantial equivalence, so you want to show yeah, well, like when you're talking to the venture capital people, you're talking about how cool it is. Uh, but in terms of regulatory, you want to show that it says it can do uh, the same thing that something else on the market can do. Um, so for class three, again, it, it depends on the false negative and false positive results. So the classification is risk-based. So if, you, if there's a, a risk of a false negative or a false positive having a a serious health implication, then uh, that's going to be something that uh, you're going to have to be concerned about and, and something that you're going to have to control, have the data to support. So 21 CFR 820 and ISO 1345. Uh, ISO 1345 is based on this. It doesn't have the um, continuous improvement aspect of 9001, 9, but uh, very similar management system. So this is the these are the headings from the the uh, 21 CFR 820. That's the the US FDA Code of Federal Regulations. So, and as you can see, it, it pretty well defines your business. So if you follow the GMPs, if you if you're if you're compliant with the GMPs, you're doing some good business uh, business things. You, stuff you would normally uh, expect in a in a in a business where you'd have design control, you'd keep records, you'd have control of your handling and storage. So all of these things need to be uh, need to be considered and, and answered. the The other thing to keep in mind is that the medical device regulations are are a broad umbrella. They're written for for many different types of applications, many different devices. So uh, some things may not apply to your device. Um, for example, we don't have installation in our in our medical device, but uh, you do need to 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 find the best way that works with your company and your setup. So, so if you don't follow the GMPs, that's considered adulteration. So very important to keep that in mind. It's not just uh, having a foreign, foreign matter in your product or uh, just not following the GMPs is, is adulteration. GMPs are the minimum requirements. And that's all I have. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So we have time for a question or two for John here on regulatory affairs. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask? So how long did it take you to get the site on through the process and how much did it cost you? Yeah, that's, uh, the, the ISO process is, is still ongoing. We have, we have our second audit mid-December. Um, but it, it, took, it took about a year. And the cost of it, I don't think we've put together all of the, all of the bills yet, but it, it is, no, no, it's, it, it's, 
so there's there's a cost to there's a cost to the ISO audit. So you'll pay for the ISO auditor, and then you'll pay for the people to to get the systems working. So originally, what what they did was they they got all the the systems, the framework in place. But um, and they and Health Canada is pretty lenient. Uh, there was some discussion with Health Canada. They're pretty lenient in what you have to do as a startup company. But the problem is that the 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 framework in in terms of ISO registration. Health Canada doesn't do the registration, so that's uh, an ISO company that is uh, accredited by Health Canada to do the registration. They are, are pretty, uh, they're sticklers, they, they are very concerned that they're giving out this piece of paper, so they make sure that everything is there. So uh, Health Canada might say, well, you, you know, it's a rolling process, but it really, to get the certification, you have to have proof that all the systems are in place and functional. So having the systems in place probably takes about four months, but then to have them functional for your product and to have the design and development all documented and, 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 and ready for that stage two audit probably takes another six months.